Hello, um, and thanks again for being here for week three of five. Um, so for the first couple of weeks, we talked a lot about um, energy efficiency in the home, in anyone's home. Um, and we covered a bit about energy poverty as well. Um, last week, uh, Efficiency Nova Scotia, Barry Walker was here. Um, I think that was a really well-received session on all the programs that are available. Um, today, I'm, uh, I bring glad tidings of uh, the recent news from CBC that was reported on CBC, among other outlets, which is um, new reports indicating that uh, we're expected to hit peak fossil fuel in 2030, meaning that that's the point where we'll have as much renewables as fossil fuels powering our energy system. So that's positive progress. And a lot of it, it's a result of government programming and places like Efficiency Nova Scotia. It's not only new technologies, but the policies that push those new technologies and make them accessible and um, give us incentive, financial incentive to use them. Um, as well as the environmental incentives that I think are fairly obvious. Um, so that is good news and we are seeing progress. That's a combination of things like heat pumps, uh, electric vehicles and the proliferation of those, um, but also um, solar and, and wind power and that transition that's happening. Um, so one part of that that um, uh, does not get as much consideration and I think part of that is because it's seen as kind of a, a, a policy wonk type of topic. So it's up my alley, um, but it's hard to make it exciting. Um, I'm gonna try for you, but it's really important. Um, and that's building codes. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about from Ecology Action Center's perspective on building codes in Nova Scotia. Um, building codes are made, there are a set of rules for, um, I'm gonna focus on new buildings. There's also codes for alterations to existing buildings. I won't get so much into that, although we're expecting new efficiency codes in that area next year from the federal government. Um, so federal government often sets kind of a standard of what's expected, but prov provinces pass the actual codes and create the codes. And then in Nova Scotia, as in many, as in several other provinces, municipalities enforce them. And they do that through building inspectors, um, that happens um, in Nova Scotia through the uh, Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Um, they, that's the provincial department. And then they have a fire marshal's office, uh, the man in charge of that, the, fire, the provincial fire marshal is Joe Rogers. So if you ever have questions about building codes, or if you ever have a position you want to share with Joe Rogers, um, look him up and email him. He's the guy. Um, but I'll talk a bit about some recent changes uh, to the building codes that are um, both uh, relevant federally, provincially, and municipally. Um, and we have um, two distinguished guests from Zap Architecture and Planning who will follow me um, and talk. Um, I think they're focusing a bit more on HRM and the, the um, planning policies, um, but the codes are obviously very relevant there too. Um, so why, why does this matter? Um, well, um, buildings generate about 42% of Nova Scotia's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so that's their oil and gas use uh, and their electricity use. Um, this is just operational. Um, this is not accounting for the embodied energy, which I talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago. So the, uh, the carbon emissions that go into the materials that, that create a building. So this is the operational. So it's a significant amount, um, a huge amount actually. Um, and if we build inefficient buildings, they last um, minimum 50 years usually. I mean, it's that's what you expect from a building, possibly longer. So um, you're, that efficiency lasts a long time. And the only way is to go back and retrofit and fix the building once you build it. So why not just build it efficiently the first time. That's kind of our argument. Um, and in fact, Canada as a country very much agrees. Um, in 2016, um, the, as pictured here, you see uh, Prime Minister with uh, then Nova Scotia Premier Steve McNeil um, sitting right by his side, um, several other premiers. Um, 
And most of the provinces signed on to what's called the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change. Um, and Nova Scotia was one of the signatories to that. And there were many commitments made in that. Um, the one I'm going to focus on was uh, the agreement to reach a net zero energy ready code for new construction by 2030. Um, I talked a bit about net zero previously, but uh, I will define that for you in a bit. Um, but this is really key. Um, that, um, that by 2030 is a key date and it's a common date used. I just started off when I said CBC, uh, among other news outlets reported that by 2030, we're expected to reach peak fossil fuels. Well, that's by intention. That's um, kind of where we've set our goals um, and all this drastic effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, because we know that we don't have much time before the climate changes beyond the 1.5 or even two degree threshold where we can't undo it, where we, we um, create a different kind of climate for ourselves that we will, will cause a great deal of calamity be, beyond even what we've seen lately. Um, so yeah, the focus here, as I said, is new houses. Um, what the approach was, um, I mean, there's a lot of concerns with this uh, tier five net zero energy ready building because it's a lot different than how um, most buildings are designed and built today. Um, so how do we get there? Um, what Canada did is they created five tiers or levels of energy efficiency. Um, and there's two sets of codes. There's actually a number of codes. I mean, codes cover everything, from fire safety, uh, water issues, um, all kinds of different issues. Energy efficiency is only one of them. So the energy efficiency codes, and they tend to divide it um, roughly by building size. So there's a set of codes for um, larger than 600 meters squared and smaller, um, but they cover residential as well as commercial and other buildings. Um, so most buildings are covered by these standards. Um, so key question, what is net zero energy ready? There's a number of buildings um, in the province that are net zero energy ready. Um, we're seeing more and more of them um, from progressive designers and architecture firms, engineers, and property owners who, who want to do this, including just individual homeowners. Um, so what it means is that a, a net zero energy ready building, it doesn't mean it's net zero now. It means it could be uh, with the addition of solar panels uh, or other renewable energy technologies. It could produce as much energy from on-site renewables as it uses in its operation. So there's all kinds of qualifiers in that statement. Um, You'll notice embodied energy is not covered. Um, so again, it's not about the energy used to build the building. It's about operational energy once it's built. Next week, um, we're going to have Will Marshall here, who's an engineer. He's going to talk about um, zero carbon buildings, which is kind of a next level uh, standard that's been created nationally. Um, and, and that they're, they're working to try and promote that and get more people committing to that standard. Um, so that's more an earlier stage of development, I'd say. Um, so net zero energy ready, it's not perfect, but it's a much higher standard than what we have now. Um, so, um, the other thing, um, which I think the, the ZAP folks might get into a little bit, is the challenge, um, even if you have a net zero energy ready building. So that, what that means compared to a building now, um, a, a typical building now would be hard to fully power with renewables. Even if you threw a bunch of solar panels on the roof, um, it's just uh, hard to find enough space in a small area um, to power an inefficient building. Uh, with strictly with renewables that are local source, particularly. Um, a number of years ago, I did a, I wrote a story when I was a writer with the coast. Um, and I interviewed a guy called Larry Hughes from Dahousie University, who's an energy specialist. And he made the case. Um, I don't know if there's that people would agree with this figure, but what he, he made the case, I mean, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that, but that anything beyond six stories, you're really, um, 
losing, I mean, his argument against height, and there's a lot of pros and cons of height, we're, we're definitely at EAC pro density in urban areas. Um, but he said, if you go beyond six stories, it's really hard to solar power that building because there's just not enough space. Um, and we're seeing interesting, like there's a new technology, solar cladding. There's actually a, a firm in Dartmouth that specializes in solar cladding. So that's kind of exciting where you, the whole siding of the building is all solar power. Um, so things could change, um, but regardless, space is a challenge especially in an inefficient building. But if you um, maximize insulation, air sealing, all the things we've talked about, uh, change the fuel sourcing, the heat pumps, which are way more efficient, um, have a good HVAC system in place overall, all these things read, uh, lead to a more efficient building. And that's just less energy that you have to generate. So that's what makes it net zero energy ready and then the next stage would be adding solar or wind or some other and there's also the um, kind of debate about um, well what if you buy carbon credits um, what if you buy into something like bullfrog power which is something that you can uh, affirm that you can invest in it's like a utility but then they invest that money into solar projects or wind projects etc that maybe aren't near you, but it's it's kind of equivalent. So does that count, even if you're actually building? So generally for net zero energy ready, we think of that as counting, but um, it's debatable whether that qualifies. Um, so what Nova Scotia did um, recently, uh, this summer, um, I was a little annoyed because they uh, chose uh, a week before my vacation time <laughs> when I was in Montreal to do this. Um, but they did kind of a public consultation process on amendments to the building codes. Um, so this was their commitment that they made um, when Canada made their five tiers um, of levels of efficiency. And the reason they did those five tiers, by the way, I don't think I ever said this, was to give the industry, the building industry in particular, uh, time to adjust because there's a lot they lack right now, um, including just the basic knowledge, the understanding of the technologies involved, um, of the different materials. There's a lot of skills trading. We don't have enough building inspectors uh, locally, especially in rural areas. Uh, there's complaints from municipalities uh, outside of Halifax that Halifax scoops up all the inspectors um, because they pay better. Solution seems obvious enough. <laughs> equal out the pay levels. But anyway, um, that's that's kind of a complaint. So there's a lot of challenges. There's a, there's real and legitimate challenges to making this adjustment. And I'm very sympathetic to the Construction Association of Nova Scotia, which often I get quoted in the media alongside them as kind of opposing points of view, but we actually get along fine. And the good news is they're totally um, in favor of the amendments that have been uh, approved in Nova Scotia. Um, so I'll talk about those a bit. Um, so they had a, a public input opportunity. So it wasn't a full on consultation. And this was kind of as a policy guy, um, it goes back to my critique and about building codes being kind of boring. Well, I think that's what the province assumes too and that average people won't really care that much. So they sent an email to every municipality, <clears throat> excuse me, in the province saying, uh, we're going to amend the building codes. What do you think? Send us your written comments. And they put it on their website as a news release. And I think some people in the industry got it. Interestingly, we didn't get notification, but we did know because we got verbal notification in a meeting leading up to that, that we had with the uh, Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Um, so we did know about it, but it was interesting that I wasn't on their mailing list. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, they th it was just a, a process of inviting comments and um interestingly we we don't know that that is uh, a month done and we haven't really heard anything and I, um, I have been told that the comments will not be made public um but i asked will there be a summary report a kind of a what we heard report um and i haven't heard back yet um so it's interesting but they did, um, and they required any change to the building codes, um, they have to make it. And I'm not suggesting anything nefarious here. I really do think it's just sort of 
this is the way it's done because they assume it's a technical thing and most people won't care. And if you read the building codes, if you can get through actually reading the building codes, um, my applause for you because I can't, like they're really dry as anything. And it's like, I, I sort of have to pick out the key points and I know what's being amended and I know what kind of the overall point is. So what they did propose um, was um, from going to tier three. Um, so not tier five by 2030, but tier three by 2028. And as I said, there's uh, two different sets of codes depending on the size of the building. So there's two different time frames, but the, the latest date is 2028 to get to tier three. Um, and I want to read this quote because this was in their press release. By adopting the national codes, building design and construction in Nova Scotia will be consistent with standards across Canada. It's a, I find that a little bit contentious and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but I will say that again, like this was also something, um, stuff like this, there were a lot of public consultations going on. There was the, uh, the coastal, the proposed coastal act, which has been delayed and delayed, like a number of environmental, the clean electricity act federally, a number of consultations that all seem to fall in the same period, late summer. Um, it was very odd. Um, and there was a lot of media coverage around it. I did a number of interviews about the carbon tax when it came out, because that happened when my colleague who actually knows more about that stuff was away on her vacation. So it ended up being me and a couple other people doing these interviews. There was an, almost no coverage of the building code thing. Um, so you have to really look for it to find this stuff because it's not really in the news much. We, um, we helped work on an op-ed that, um, ended up coming from Brian Gifford, who spoke in week one um, about energy poverty. Um, and that was in Saltwire. And then Halifax Examiner did a nice article about it that was really detailed, but it's behind a paywall. So not everyone can even see that. Um, and that was it really uh, for local coverage. So, um, so what are the tiers? This is kind of important because um, as I said, net zero, energy ready is tier five. That's where we want to get to by 2030. Um, but what Nova Scotia has proposed is tier three. So this uh, slide is actually from Efficiency Canada, which is a nonprofit efficiency group um, led by uh, Corey Diamond and Brendan Haley, who used to work at College Action Center in my role a number of years ago. Um, and um, Brendan in particular is really like a policy um, aficionado uh, on energy efficiency stuff. Um, so they came up with these figures. I don't know how well you can see those, but um, it's they they nicely kind of broken them down to how much energy reduction you would see. Um, and I want to compare those. Like you see at tier four, it would be forty percent, um, but um, uh, a local energy efficiency aficionado in Nova Scotia. Um, who was um, involved in the process came up with these figures. So they're slightly different. And I think they also vary depending on the kind of building and there's a lot of factors. So these are rough figures. Um, but here, um, tier three, where we're aiming for is a 50% reduction by 2028 um, in energy use based on efficiency measures. So that's really good. That's a significant improvement. So our response to the province was, kudos on going to tier three. This is really great progress. Um, and when we spoke to them in that um, call, I mentioned in the meeting we had with them, um, they were saying, we're still gonna be uh, the leader of the nation. Nova Scotia is considered one of the leaders in energy efficiency. Um, going back to Efficiency Canada, they do an annual report card on uh, province by province and they grade them. And this year, Nova Scotia finished number two in the country for energy efficiency policy, um, largely because of the work of Efficiency Nova Scotia, but also because um, a lot of work targeted towards Mi'kmaq communities. Um, they have the Mi'kmaq Home Energy Efficiency Program, which has been really effective with great uh, uptake um, on reserve housing, um, and then focused on African Nova Scotians and energy poverty. Um, so a lot of social equity work as well as um, general energy efficiency work. So that's why they, we tend to get a really good grade. 
Um, who does better is usually uh, British Columbia. They're, they're kind of the, the gold standard and Quebec often performs really well too. But to perform, to finish second in the nation for a small province, I think, good job, Nova Scotia. I mean, that's actually to be applauded. Um, but what we were kind of pointing out to the province was, you're kind of slipping, like you're kind of, and, and you're not um, there at this point anyway, there didn't seem to be any focus on the building, um, the building codes. And we were kind of, they were under the gun because they had promised by a certain time to do it. And it wasn't even really mentioned much in their climate plan, which came out almost a year ago now. Um, and so we were pushing them on that and they were getting a bit annoyed with us and saying, um, we're hearing you say like New Brunswick's going to pass us because they've um, promised net zero energy ready buildings by 2032, but they haven't actually done anything, which is true. They haven't really legislated anything yet. Um, and they said, nobody's legislated anything yet and we're going to be the first. And which brings me back to this. Uh, building design and construction will be consistent with standards across Canada. Um, the reason I think that's a little bit of a debatable statement is because, again, Canada has promised to go to net zero energy ready by 2030. And so even if we're the first to legislate it, if we only go to tier three, we may fall behind. And in fact, British Columbia um, has put in their climate plan the equivalent document to the one Nova Scotia did last December, um, that they would go, all new buildings would be net zero energy ready by 2030. Um, so that's legislated. Um, so we, we are worried that, um, okay, it's great what they've done, but our message was, uh, what are you gonna do after that? Because we still are supposed to get, that leaves you only two years to get to the next, level. Um, so having said that, that's why the time is now, in our opinion. Um, however, there are these legitimate worries, um, labor shortages. EAC actually commissioned a study that um, showed if Nova Scotia meets all of its greenhouse gas reduction commitments that it has made by 2030, it would create about 15,000 new jobs per year until then in this field. So where are they gonna come from? Meanwhile, the Construction Association of Nova Scotia has said due to succession, people retiring basically, there's gonna be about a $15,000 job, or sorry, 15,000 person job shortage. Uh, 15,000 jobs that won't be filled. Those are two separate numbers. So that adds up to 30. Um, so that's a huge gap. So um, finding laborers and anyone who's tried to hire contractors lately knows it's very challenging uh, and there's there's usually huge backlogs um, and that's just legitimate labor shortages. Um, supply shortages, um, we hear about the global supply chain all the time since COVID um, is very true and the supplies are changing because what is energy efficient is always changing. So. There's innovation, there's people looking for different kinds of supplies than they had before. Um, so that's a real challenge. And the knowledge gaps. And as I said, the building inspectors are part of that. There's just not enough trained people. Um, but there are big advantages to the change. And that's why I think the time is now. And my argument is kind of set the standard as high as possible and then let the industry innovate. I find it really interesting that in the um, comments from the construction industry on this, they're pro the amendments to higher tiers of energy efficiency. They're okay with that as long as they're consistent and they know what to expect. Um, part of the reason for that is there's actually big financial incentives to do it. Although a building that's built to net zero energy ready can be eight to 9% uh, more expensive to build, the long-term savings is huge. Um, 24 to 35% reduction in operational costs per year. And as I said, building span, lifespan is 50 years or more. So that's a long, large savings that looms. Um, so it's worth reconsidering how buildings are financed. And that's one of the challenges involved, but the savings are, are actually much more than the costs. Um, 
some things that put Nova Scotia in a good position for this. Um, one is that we have a lot of energy advisors here, uh, 3.4 certified energy advisors per 100,000, 10,000 households, which is among the highest in Canada. Um, that's because of the work of Efficiency Nova Scotia, the Clean Foundation. They've been actively training energy assessors uh, to go out and do home energy assessments, and which qualifies people for um, uh, rebates, energy rebates, as Barry Walker talked about last week. Um, so what that means is we know um, how we know how to do this. We have the knowledge. We just need to build and use that. Um, and I've been kind of making the case that um, there's a lot of focus on building inspectors, but compliance with higher levels of energy efficiency is actually usually based um, not on performance, but on modeling. Um, because once you do the work, once you add insulation, um, proper building ceiling, fuel switching, et cetera, when you build a building the right way, we know they're energy efficient. You don't have to measure every single one. You don't have to inspect everyone as long as you know legitimately it's built right. So good modeling goes a long way. And we have efficiency in Nova Scotia with that expertise, clean foundation and other areas. Um, so we've been kind of advocating that the province consider using those instead of the fire marshal's office, um, which is already over capacity. And I don't know if people have seen, but there have been auditor general reports in the past few years about the fire marshal's office not meeting its uh, requirements of inspecting buildings for fire safety. <laughs> so um, if it's already behind on its caseload, basically, um, maybe it's time to consider other options for how you manage this whole energy efficiency system. Um, an argument that I've also heard um, uh, people worried about the, the changes in building codes is that we have a housing crisis, an affordable housing crisis. Um, we've all seen the tents around. We know homelessness is a very in your face and prevalent problem um, and one that never should have gotten to this point. Um, but we're making the case that, um, as I said, slightly more expensive to build a net zero energy rated building, but cheap, much cheaper to the operate in the long term. And um, really interesting case study in Nova Scotia, add some house um, built uh, pa using passive design, um, a 25 unit deeply affordable um, housing um, operation. And deeply affordable means it's not just a little bit below market rates, it's legitimately affordable for low income families. Um, and there's a, a, a income threshold that they had to meet and they did. Um, and it's completely passive design. So it exceeds net zero energy ready standards. Um, and it creates a, a beautiful, this is called the Sunflower uh, Building Project if you're interested uh, in looking it up. Um, it's really cool and it's in HRM. Um, and really interesting project and just shows that net zero or energy efficient in general, it does not mean uh, exclusive or expensive necessarily. It can actually be quite affordable. Um, and we've also argued that um, regarding the, the jobs, the shortage of jobs, our goal should then be to attract young uh, workers in this industry and how do you do that? By creating a place with lots of innovative and interesting projects, such as Net Zero Energy Ready. Um, and we've been working uh, a bit with Nova Scotia Community College, um, particularly their international school and their newcomer students, kind of promoting green jobs to them and trying to get them thinking about that as a legitimate option where there's a lot of growth. Um, and they have also developed, uh, working with the province, um, and other players, a new uh, climate microcredit. So a microcredit is a course you can take fairly quickly with 15 to 20 hours of study and then examinations. And um, it's, it's basically uh, a course you do in a short period of time rather than over a whole term. And what that is is for, uh, con they have a construction kind of program, um, but you learn about climate change and climate change reduction and the relationship with energy efficiency and energy efficient building methods. Um, so this is um, 
a start, we think. We'd like to see a lot more of that. Uh, we'd like to see that kind of accreditation built into all uh, post-secondary programs um, because everybody needs to be thinking about the climate emergency and what we're going to do about it, whatever their field. Um, and then um, I mentioned pre-manufacture or simple building shape. So um, actually the reason I know um, ZAP is because we work with them, uh, Zara Williams, who works at ZAP, uh, who's a partner there, um, on a panelized retrofit study of a building in Dartmouth. Um, the building's owned by Vita Living, um, which offers affordable um, building uh, rental units, basically. Um, and they have uh, a building in Dartmouth, call, uh, which is a multi-unit residential building, or MERB, as we tend to call them. And these are kind of uniformly shaped buildings. They're across the province. There's about 40,000 uh, units of housing or apartments uh, in these buildings across the province. Um, they were all built before the 90s, most of them before the 70s, so long before current building standards of efficiency. Um, they therefore they're quite inefficient and the potential to improve their energy efficiency is huge the reason because they're all shaped the same and roughly the same size um, so you can pre-manufacture uh, new siding to kind of insulate the exterior similar to what ecology action center did when we retrofitted our building um, and it's called um, a panelized retrofit and then you change the, the mechanics of the building. So you uh, replace the um, current heating system with heat pumps um, and you put in a proper HVAC and all this stuff. It's not a cheap rental necessarily, but again, the long-term savings for the landlord is actually much greater. It creates a more comfortable environment for the residents and it's low impact on them. You don't have to um, vacate your apartment for months. Well, this goes on. It can be done actually in a couple of days, uh, the panelized retrofit. Um, so that kind of innovation, figuring out ways to do efficiency uh, in better ways. Again, that's the kind of thing that attracts um, people to this industry uh, and fills their just jobs, vacancies. Um, so this is just a picture of a panelized retrofit model. Um, and Zara actually tuned me into this um, company called Smarter Spaces, smarterspaces.ca. If you want to look it up, they have some cool 3D imaging and they use um, laser technology to create this 3D imaging, which has all kinds of efficiency potential for new buildings. And um, they're used around town. Uh, they're a Nova Scotia company. Um, the reason that's so helpful is because um, they can show you little crevices and places um, in progress, they do a lot of stuff in elevator shafts in progress, and they find potential flaws early in the process because human error is just always a thing. Even though you're um, working with some great professionals, people make mistakes. Um, the computers tend to catch those. Um, and this is a technology, it's a really neat technology that can catch the mistakes early in the process and save a lot of wasted, what would otherwise be wasted materials. Um, this is something you also use in a panelized retrofit um, to show um, how to what specifics you need for your new ex building exterior that you're building offsite. Um, since you're not working closely along, um, you need to be very precise when you build the thing. And so you need to know all the oddities and weirdnesses about your building that every building has because they're after a certain age. Um, one thing we've um, been talking a lot with the province, and I've also met with a number of municipalities to talk about this, is the idea of municipal uh, empowerment. Um, and NSFM is the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities. Um, and I'll just say that years ago, I worked on um, with the Ecology Action Center on the issue of pesticides. And we wanted a, a lawn pesticide ban because we work with a lot of um, pesticide sensitive people who have been exposed and had their lives ruined uh, by chemicals that people put on for aesthetic reasons for their lawns. And our argument was, um, you know, these, these aren't really, these are kind of chemicals, these aren't farming chemicals that are needed to, for the food system. 
these are kind of aesthetic, purely aesthetic things. So we advocated for a, a ban on those. Um, we worked with Canadian Cancer Society and a large network of health organizations. Um, what we found effective was when we worked with, at the time it was called the Union of Nova Scotia Municipalities or UNSM, now basically NSFM. And um, there were municipalities that were interested, like Wolfville was really keen on passing a ban on this. H, uh, Halifax had one already, um, but Wolfville and others, they weren't allowed to pass a ban like that. And so they got together collectively, all 55 municipalities in the province and put in a request to the province um, that they support a provincial ban. And that is what convinced the province to do it. So it shows the power of a unified voice. 55 municipalities is a very strong voice. We're kind of working on a similar approach a bit here, although it's very early days and it's much harder. And not every municipality wants to, wants to be involved because they're a little afraid of the uh, building codes and uh, the building inspector issue and these barriers. <clears throat> so they're not sure they feel ready. But what I've been arguing is that each municipality should have the power to pass its own um, standards. Canadian, uh, the con or sorry, the association, the construction association, they don't love this idea. They prefer uniformity. I understand that. It makes it predictable. It makes it straightforward for them. Um, but our case is that um, like Halifax definitely would love to have the ability to go to tier five um, to require all new buildings to be built to the net zero standard, but they can't. They don't have the power to create that kind of bylaw. Um, they can only really regulate their own buildings, which they've done. Uh, and they've encouraged, um, they've passed a motion, they've encouraged, but it's really voluntary for private developers to, to go to the net zero standard. Bridgewater has done the same. Uh, a few other municipalities I've talked to have expressed interest in the same. Um, but they can't make it legally binding. Um, so that's kind of something we're pushing for is that each municipality really deserves the right to pass the level it's comfortable with. And if you're not interested, if you don't feel you're ready, then you don't have to, you don't have to pass those. It's up to each municipality. Um, and in other provinces, we see that with um, certain charter cities like Vancouver and Toronto, they have much higher energy efficiency standards um, than the rest of their province. Um, and one of the reasons we advocate that is because, uh, but also the province is because there's federal funding, um, because we have, um, the, the Canada as a nation is big on greenhouse gas reductions right now. They've put significant amounts of funding into projects that are municipally based, um, that are striving toward net zero. Um, and in Nova Scotia, there's a, a really interesting one in Cape Breton um, that's run by New Dawn. I don't know if people know that organization, but they're, they're a nonprofit, but they kind of function. They're all about supporting social enterprises. Um, and so they're, they've created a community solar garden. Um, so they have this property actually called Pine Tree Park Estates, which is a former military base, which is now assisted housing uh, for seniors and people with mobility restrictions. Um, and they have kind of supportive housing and um, staff like medical professionals and others on staff uh, for those who need it. Um, so they've created a solar garden um, and improved their energy efficiency and heating systems. So essentially gone to net zero energy ready and beyond with the actual solar garden there to power it. Um, and they've received two and a half million dollars um, from the federal government to support that work. So there's huge financial opportunities to fund this. Similar to um, if, you're, if you're a homeowner, you own a home, you know you want to improve your energy efficiency, but it's a big upfront cost. So how do you do it? You go to Efficiency Nova Scotia, you get an energy assessment and you get it. Well, it's a similar thing. They've identified this need for a large community to do this, 25 units of housing. Um, it's a significant expense, so the federal government is funding them to help them get there. Um, so we're encouraging the province to be part of the solution, um, and we feel that Tier 5 
building codes. So net zero energy ready by 2030 is essential to meet the province's greenhouse gas uh, reduction goals. Um, and we feel that that should be done through collaboration with municipalities, with Efficiency Nova Scotia, Clean Foundation, with energy assessors, um, and that will enable a smooth transition and process, and also with the Construction Association um, and that industry as a whole, and architects and engineers and others who are involved, the professionals. Um, and we feel that this should really should be driving economic growth. When I started that, citing the fact that we're heading toward peak fossil fuels, well, there's a new industry going to replace that. And that's things like renewables and efficiency and all that require, that's jobs, that's labor, that requires investment, but it's also going to be profitable. Um, and I want to close with um, one of my favorite quotes, which is from Paul Hawkins, who wrote uh, The Ecology of Commerce. Um, the first part of this quote, which I couldn't fit on the slide, um, is um, if you aren't concerned about the future, you don't really understand what the science of climate change is telling you. Um, you should be concerned. But if you meet the people working uh, to restore this earth and the lives of the poor and you aren't optimistic, you haven't got a pulse. Ordinary people are willing to confront despair, power, incalculable odds to restore, to restore grace, justice, and beauty in this world. How does that apply here? Well, I'm confident. Um, I'm concerned, but I'm confident um, in Nova Scotia's building community um, and that with the provincial government support of taking it, like making it a standard net zero and perhaps zero carbon, carbon buildings later on, um, with that support, we can make this transition. And I don't want to, I feel like the, the industry, um, the, the status quo is sort of tier one, but a lot of people in that a lot of buildings are already be, being built to tier two and sometimes tier three. So it's interesting that the industry on its own is kind of leading this process. And I have been urging the province, well, why don't you take the lead and take us further um, than that? So that's kind of the message I wanted to give. Um, we're, gonna um, do a 10 minute break before uh, the zap folks come up, but, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves. I only just met them today, so um, these these two, but um, before we break, uh, I'm happy to take any questions on that. Oh yeah, and please wait till the mic comes to you before you ask. One question here, Chris. Where does public education reside? Because we hear a lot of things, if it's in you know, an advocacy way, mm -hmm. I often don't listen. I don't know what to listen to. And I really wonder what would be different if we were better educated on these topics. One thing I can say is, talking to somebody about recycling. And she said, Nova Scotia is leading the way. And I said, why aren't you telling us that? Because hmm. I get kind of tired of it sometimes. And I could be encouraged, but there's got, there's got to be more public education. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think public education is important, very important, and that's why I do things like this. I mean, that's why we set up this class as a part of that. We do, and that's why we do our sessions with Nova Scotia Community College to try and um, engage that group. That's why we visit Mi'kmaq communities to talk about home energy efficiency. Um, that's all part of it. Um, we struggle a lot too with, I mean, uh, the media role and all that, because I find the media is very challenging these days. Um, Recently, we used to rely a lot on social media, but recent um, t the change in ownership of Twitter has really changed the nature of that. That was a popular one. And Facebook, um, with the Canadian regulations and the pushback from Facebook and Google, it's hard to share even news items. And on top of that, the news items themselves tend to be broken into sound bites. So they're not very nuanced. Um, you don't really get a full discussion. Like the carbon tax, 
it's a really interesting um, piece of policy. The premier called it a blunt instrument, and I can't disagree. Like it because all taxation instruments are kind of blunt. Like there's a bluntness about them. We think it's a good step. That's our opinion. People do have legitimate disagreements, but the way it kind of appears on the TV news is me talking about, oh, it's good, and here's why we think it can shift resources toward uh, better efficiency, more electric vehicles. And then you get a person filling their gas tank and saying, $15 more for gas, it's ridiculous. And that's kind of the debate. And that's not really a good debate or good discussion for either side. Neither one of us really got our point across. And, you know, it's like, it's, it, uh, it's, I, I agree that, and we, I'm, I work, I'm also on the board of uh, Climate Story Network, which is a brand new thing. Uh, Sean Kelly started it. He used to work at Clean Foundation. He's a communications guy by background. And his thing, he's trying to place climate stories, stories of communities taking positive climate action on their own in community newspapers, because they're widely read. They're not always well-funded, um, so it's free content for them because they're hit the Climate Story Network is, is non-profit um, and will be grant-funded. So the idea is to place a lot of these stories that are about regular people doing things uh, because we feel a lot of people are worried about the climate change situation but aren't sure what good policy looks like or means or what the difference is. So we're trying to kind of improve the storytelling situation and the public education situation but it's a huge task and you're right it's a huge challenge and we need i mean i'd love to see our post-secondary institutions doing much more and they have lectures and things like this but i don't know that those appeal to a mass audience um, and i think we have to we have to stop pandering to the extremes of debate like we tend to think okay we have to counter the climate deniers but they're very small, I think, in size. And then on this side, you have people like me who are fully engaged in this stuff. Yeah, and in the middle, you have most people who are concerned, but uncertain. And they need more information and honest information and nuanced discussion about pros and cons of things. So we'd like to see a lot more of that, for sure. And th this is part of that, but we're one small group. So yeah, we definitely societally need a much bigger version of that. Probably more of a commentary and an ad addition to what this lady has said, but just wondering what your comments are on the Alberta's recent campaign. We're all going to be in the dark, full page, two full pages in Saturday's paper, I believe it was. Yeah. So very negative. So just looking for your comments on that. And again, I guess the other question I'll have, so it's two questions. Your The impact on the provincial uh, taking over uh, approvals or uh, for new construction and that type of thing. So because it ties into what you're talking about yeah so two questions two separate issues thank, thank you. you yeah good questions um first of all i'll say that um brian gifford who uh presented with me in week one watch for his op-ed his op-ed extraordinary guy that coming out soon in saltwire about the alberta thing um my colleague brenna um has been on cbc talking about the alberta campaign for those who may not know, Alberta government has funded ads that are being placed uh, in other places. Very, There's a lot of targeted ones in Nova Scotia saying, um, fight the federal clean electricity bill. It's going to um, put us all in the dark. It's going to be way more energy. Um, I would kind of lump this into a broader category that we've been struggling with, which is politicking. And I... Tr I try to be nonpartisan as possible, and that's EAC is nonpartisan and not, I mean, I talk about the federal government is, is concerned about climate change and doing things about it. It's not perfect, and I'm not pro-liberal and not whatever. It's not about that. It's just that whatever one government does, the other party seems inclined to oppose it. And so 
And it's interesting, you see parties that were pro-carbon tax, but then when the other guys pass it, suddenly they're anti-carbon tax and vice versa. And there's this all weird positioning. And to me, I mean, my pushback is always, we're in an emergency. We cannot act this way. When your house is on fire, you don't worry about who forgot to flush the toilet. You don't worry about those petty little debates that families have. And I equate these political things to that. It's like they're having petty debates over policy when they should be having honest discussions about what's the best way forward from this crisis we're facing, which is climate change, catastrophic climate change. That's, that's what's at stake. The time is now. Not every solution is going to be perfect. Um, and these things should be debated. Um, a climate tax should be debated, but not, not this way. And I find those ads, it's really about political positioning. I find some of the recent debates in the House, um, you know, like certain parties, I was at a, a hearing about energy poverty, and I thought it was going to be, I was naive thinking it would be a fact-finding mission by the politicians. They would be asking us questions, trying to address energy poverty. And I found the two parties just used it to go at each other through us. And they asked questions, but they were really just launching attacks on each other, the three parties. And it's so frustrating because it's an emergency and we need to move part of it. So yeah, what's the solution? I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of really interesting democracy groups, pro-democracy groups in Canada that talk about that and citizen engagement. And I think that is just the opposite of that and trying to persuade us through ads to hate on one, one policy um, is not what's, so what's your alternative, Alberta? <laughs> what are you proposing instead? Tell us that. And I think we should stop focusing on attacking the other and focus more on, okay, here's a solution that we propose that we think would be helpful. And it's one of our frustrations with the province is that in terms of the carbon tax, they were invited to propose alternatives and they didn't really do that. And so we got what we got. And to me, it's that disqualifies you from complaining about it because you refuse to promote an alternative of your own. So You can corner Chris during the little break. <laughs> if he's available. Break? Okay, so we'll okay. take a 10-minute break and I'll hand it off to um, my colleagues at Zap. So. Yes, so I will leave on to you, sir. Just like this? Yeah. You'll hear from Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, good. We all good? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear myself. All okay. right. We'll, we'll try to keep some distance so we don't do some like reverberating <laughs> here. Um, okay, well, thank you everyone for coming today and thank you for having us. Uh, thank you, Chris, for introducing us in your presentation and uh, inviting us to speak today. Uh, my name is Connor Wallace. I'm a principal at uh, ZAP Architecture and Planning. We are a planning and architecture consulting firm. Uh, we work mainly in the feedback uh, mainly in the uh, development space land development space primarily focused here in HRM as what well, we do practice across the province of Nova Scotia and the Atlantic Canadian region uh, however majority of our projects are focused in the Halifax region uh, this is my colleague Adam Adam's an architect and our director of practice uh, Adam's recently joined us within the past couple of months uh, and has a long career um both in Canada and the United States, working in the architectural field. Uh, so we have a brief presentation for you today, going through sharing a bit of our experience working in this space and tying it a bit to the um, information that Chris was speaking to in his presentation around energy efficiency and the impacts of climate change and how we're moving forward as we grow as a community and build new buildings um, and kind of how, how that interacts with climate change and the implications of that. So this is our faces. We can do a quick skip by this one. You can see us in person today. We're used to doing these virtually over the um, last few months and years. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is part of what we do is the 
interpretation and implementation of what are now really complex planning and development regulations. Chris spoke a lot to the building code and we're gonna get into that in our presentation a lot. But a lot of what we do initially um, in combination with interpreting the building code is interpreting planning and development and regulations that authorities having jurisdiction set in place. In the case of health acts, our authority having jurisdiction is Halifax Regional Municipality. Uh, they implement and uh, create bylaws for how development can be, where it can be located, how dense it can be, what that development looks like. So these are bylaws that we interpret every day and um, design buildings and projects that can be implemented under them. Uh, so what HRM has done over recent years, and you may have heard this term in, in uh, public discourse, is the center plan. Um, they targeted growth and density and development to their regional center, um, which is the Halifax Peninsula and Dartmouth inside the circum circumferential highway. And the goal of this plan was to incentivize growth and development and density in an area where people have access to existing services, where you're not extending services, which comes with costs and um, long-term maintenance um, and sustainable implications. So there was a lot of um, intentions with this plan that also are, are correlated with co uh, compacting against the climate change, the, the threats of climate change by creating more compact and sustainable forms of development by locating people closer and uh, to services. Uh, so within that, there's some really um, key strengths that HRM has brought forward that to the design community that have created flexibility and opportunity for innovation and in implementing the, uh, the building code requirements in a way that can create interesting buildings, beautiful buildings, and buildings that can potentially be energy efficient. Um, so they, as I mentioned, they added development rates kind of across the spectrum through a variety of housing forms uh, and in areas where uh, services are available. They did so, things such as the removal and reduction of significant reduction of parking requirements. Uh, parking can often drive design decisions as well as design uh, costs of buildings and um, design oriented towards private vehicle culture is also counter, counterintuitive to the intent of this plan as well. So they, they use that as a tool to relax that, to really allow the market to decide how they would like to bring park to their, uh, parking to their building. Um, but it creates a situation where it's not driving design decisions. It's not um, a requirement that's you know informing how a building is designed. Uh, they have increased building heights in, in, in certain areas uh, in places like Roby Street, Gottagen Street, uh, Quinpool Road, areas where there's existing access to amenities and services. Um, and they've also inter introduced a, a term called floor area ratio, which we have a little diagram here, which essentially assigns a certain amount of area that a, a developer can build on a property, but provides flexibility about how that area is distributed amongst the development in lot. So for example, a hundred square meter building could be one story that's a hundred square meters, or it could be two stories that's 50 square meters, or it could be four stories that's 25 square, square meters. That's kind of just a simple diagram explaining how, um, floor area ratio works, but the intent of it is to kind of give that flexibility and adaptability for sites and for designers to design buildings um, under and, the and new plan. Just, and I'll just jump in. Uh, each one of these options would have very different uh, kind of amounts of exterior envelope and kind of associated details where the windows would be. So just even at a very high level, this has some impact on the efficiency of the building or how the building will perform. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is a, a just a really kind of initial diagram of a project that we were working on um, at the early stages. And the reason why we did quickly bring this up is to just highlight some of the level of detail of the regulations that inform how buildings are designed. And then um, maybe Adam can then dive into how that leads ties into the designing for energy efficiency and sustainability of the building. Uh, so when Within the center plan document, there's a lot of beyond assigning um, density and, and building heights to properties. They include a lot of what's called built form regulations. So that defines how far a building can be from a property line, where it may need to step in from um, certain property lines and things like that. So they kind of define the envelope in the building form. And these require a lot of setbacks and step backs to create transitions from neighboring properties um, and, and other kind of intents of the plan. What that does though, is create a lot of different variations in form with requirements for a lot of variations in form within the building. Uh, so you can see here that there's a kind of a portion of the building that in the plan it kind of identifies as a street wall. So this is intended to be a portion of the building that's more at a scale of three to two to three stories. That's more, um, you know, human scale, relatable from the sidewalk, that type of thing with what they call a step back up to a taller portion of the building. And what this introduces is, um, 
the elements I mentioned in terms of improving uh, uh, the pedestrian experience, or, and that's kind of the intent of this regulation. However, it does introduce complexity as it relates to building design. Um, and maybe Adam, you can speak to that a bit in terms of what that challenges bring. Right, absolutely. So I think um, to, I guess, to pull back to the previous slide when we were talking about the different volumes of space and how much exterior wall you have. Um, if you go to the next slide, sorry, Connor. Um, as you can see here, you know, every time we step back, we're creating, if you had the same volume of building that was going straight up, for instance, you'd only have so much of that exterior wall. But as soon as you add kind of steps, you're adding more complexity, you're adding more floors, you're adding more roof. And in doing all of that, you're creating transitions that generally expand the amount of envelope uh, in relationship to the volume that you're enclosing. Um, and those are all opportunities for heat loss or, or losing either heating or cooling that you're uh, generating inside the building. So with this, we're, we're right now, we're kind of wrestling that balance of, you know, adhering to these requirements in the plan, but also adhering to the goals of energy efficiency and potentially much more uh, stringent goals around energy efficient for efficiency for buildings. And as you had mentioned, Chris, creating net zero buildings on site is challenging because there's not a lot of room. And by creating more complex buildings that are more prone to energy loss, it can create a challenge by kind of meeting those goals simultaneously. Um, so the, I think there's a balance. There's a way that, again, it's kind of having more discourse about this, having more collaboration amongst experts that um, both in the planning field as well as the design field to understand how can these buildings be designed in a way that's you know, meeting that intent of human scale and be beautiful de urban design and also creating energy efficiency into sustainable buildings. There can be, we think, a happy medium. Um, and, and, you know, we're working towards those goals with the municipality as we speak. This is just a bit of, um, again, kind of speaking into some of that flexibility around design and tying back to some of the design details in the in the plan. And um, the plan does speak to having kind of three-story street walls as kind of a very prominent design feature within our city when we're talking about more dense buildings. So these are buildings containing, typically containing multiple residential units, sometimes being mixed-use buildings with multiple residential units and commercial units as well. Um, and get, again, kind of Get, introducing more opportunity for play with street wall heights and other upper proportions of the buildings may be an opportunity for us to explore design methods and simplicity in buildings that could support good quality design and also energy efficiency as well. And context matters. If you're in a if you're in a neighborhood or have a streetscape that's all five stories or if it's all two stories, you know some variation on where that street wall um, limit is. Uh, should relate back to the actual streetscape that it's on. Um, you know, a building on Hollis Street or Barrington is probably different um, than it might be if you're in a more rural area or something with less context to build upon, especially in the city where we're often drawing on um, a more historic um, kind of building stock where we're kind of trying to make it fit in with the context that's there. Usually there's kind of lower height buildings and it's important to kind of respect those those lines and those datums. Yeah, and that's a really good point. I think we are in an interesting context in Halifax, particularly within the center plan where there's it's been an area target of growth, but geographically area geographic area within the regional center is significantly low rise um, housing. Uh, so it's it's you know tar targeting these areas for growth, but finding ways that they can be integrated. I think again requires mm -hmm. some more discourse. Requires looking at a bit more specific site context, how they can be. Um, more so integrated into a particular street, maybe, as opposed to an entire region. Um, this one's, again, kind of probably getting us a bit closer into the details of the of the building code. So again, we'll try to make this as interesting as possible. But uh, this is getting into some of the, basically how buildings are constructed and how planning regulations and how building code regulations and how they coincide um, can impact uh, how buildings are constructed, what they're constructed out of, and how energy efficient they can be. Uh, so this is an example on the left here of a project, um, a kind of a mid-rise building, I believe it's eight or nine stories. Um, and it here represents kind of two different floor assemblies depending on the construction typology. So maybe Adam, if you want to explain those a bit more a detail. Absolutely. So the one on the, on the top is showing kind of a concrete floor assembly. Um, the, the diagram is showing about eight inches and below uh, would be kind of a wood frame uh, or mass timber CLT floor assembly with beam. Um, generally speaking, I think we're all familiar with uh, 
you know, general house construction, we're used to kind of those, uh, those floor depths or those floor joists of, you know, about a foot plus a finished floor and a finished ceiling. Um, when we get into some of the larger construction types, um, concrete is one that allows us to keep that thickness uh, relatively small, you know, put it within the foot range, um, which is why we see so many concrete buildings that are going to be multifamily just because of the the height or thickness of that floor that allows you, if you have a height cap, you want to get as many floors as you can within kind of your height cap. And obviously those floor thicknesses matter, uh, especially if you need to go an extra foot in depth to accommodate steel or some sort of wood framing, then you're losing, you're not losing, but essentially it's adding a foot of thickness for every story. So you go up nine stories, then if it was a different type of construction, potentially you could have the density of another floor in there. So um, something that we look at as well is the mass timber option, which does have the ability to be a thinner floor system, but of course you still need to support that. And when you're moving uh, mechanical systems, electrical systems, it can still have an impact on your overall floor depth if you're holding that up with beams, for instance. Um, but something just, it does relate back to the building form and how we're building and the speed in which we can build because, you know, the concrete, um, the diagram shown above is, is what we're seeing a lot of right now. Mm -hmm. Totally. And so on the far right here represents, this is the same site, same building. This on the top right would be the building with a construction of uh, concrete. So a concrete structure and it, uh, it is within the maximum height cap. However, it is a nine story building. Whereas because of the floor assembly of the wood, wood building, we're unable to achieve a nine story building within the height cap. So this is in a sense, creating an incentive to build this out of concrete. Um, so, you know, it's a reason why there's, build, there's a lot of concrete buildings going up. We're also, our development industry right now is familiar with building concrete buildings in multifamily housing. So it's a lot of like, this is what we know, um, but it really ties back to your original point, Chris, of if we can create more incentive or requirements that kind of, in a sense, force development to innovate is gonna be really be the solution here because right now they're really stuck in their ways of, and and there's a lot of incentive of reasoning why there's there's not a lot a lot of opportunity right now to explore alternative options in today's market. So that's why a lot of stuff is getting built out of these types of materials. But we are you know working every day to try to find design solutions to see how we can integrate different materials, more innovative technologies to build buildings to get more variety in our marketplace. This represents uh, a site that um, you may be a bit familiar with the context. This is an area near Spring Garden Road and Carlton Street um, and near the downtown of Halifax. This is just an initial kind of massing study we were looking at under the new planning regulations for this property. Um, these are the white buildings represent existing buildings in the area. This is an area within the plan that was targeted for quite intense growth. Um, it was targeted with its most in, um, dense zone in terms of the amount of land uses permitted within it. Uh, so it allows a lot of commercial uses, multi-unit housing, that type of thing. And then it also was assigned the highest possible floor area ratio, meaning it, it, they really targeted this area of the city for density. Um, but as I mentioned, the plan does have a lot more layers than uh, just the, the density and the zoning itself. It has a lot of built form requirements that define how the building looks in relation to its neighbors. This site does also uh, about Camp Hill Cemetery here to the north. Um, so with that, it does have some specific requirements because within the plan that cemetery is officially designated as parkland, um, it does have some requirements associated with it. So although the site is, you know, designated for 8.0 FAR and, and is designated for um, intense housing growth, when you apply all of the other built form re requirements or the FAR is about 5.3 and 4.2 for the two buildings. So it, it's reflective of how there are a lot of layers to the plan and regulations. And when you layer in all those planning regulations, as well as the regulations associated with the building code around energy efficiency and fire life safety, mm -hmm. it creates a different picture um, than just the direct translation of that floor area ratio. So it, it's been an interesting experience in going through that on projects. Sorry, well, ahead, while you have those graphics up, I think this image is a really good example of something we'll talk about in a minute as we talked a little bit about solar power roof mount roof mounted pv is pretty common as an approach to uh, generate power on site and you can see the you know the built form regulations here if we are putting all if if the site is limited in area and we're putting pv on the roof the step backs also reduce the amount of area you have to put pv on 
Um, so that's that's another consideration or a challenge that we're constantly faced with is, you know, as we have to step back and step back as we go further up, the, almost the taller the building you have in this situation, it's caused for a roof area that is going to get diminished significantly as you go up. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is another example, kind of similar to the first one that we wanted to bring up too. Again, kind of be, just be reflective of, she'll reflect some of the more modern buildings that are being built under these new planning regulations. This is another kind of very preliminary design. This building hasn't been constructed yet, um, but we, we thought it was representative of a lot of the new kind of development that is going up. You see a lot of these buildings of this similar scale in the, in the north end of Halifax that have recently been constructed. Um, and this is really, they've written the planning regulations for the center plan to you know incentivize or you know have buildings of this type of form and design um you know aside from you know maybe the window proportions materials that type of thing but i'm, I'm more so focusing on the general form of it mm -hmm. and from uh the intent behind that was you know very strong if we were trying to create more pedestrian focused human scaled city trying to grow a city that i mentioned this right now off in a lot of areas low-rise residential housing we know we have a lot of growth we need to do as a city, but doing it in a way that's sensitive and, and grows in a way that um, integrates with our city as opposed to overpowering it. So there's a lot of good intent behind this. With that as well, it creates a lot of complexity in the way these buildings are designed and constructed, especially when it comes to both cost, but particularly energy efficiency as well. Um, so maybe Adam, if you want to speak to that a bit more as it relates to particularly this building and then just kind of the general build form as well. Absolutely. Uh, so I think this is another another great image just to show some of the complexity of the form as you go up the building uh, rooftop as well being significantly lower than the site area that would have been available. I think the, you know, the street frontage, how it addresses uh, the human scale, I think is great. It's also a question um, as we look at that kind of the podium level or the, the street wall, how it would relate back to the adjacent buildings. Um, but, you know, some of these geometries that are kind of coming out of the center plan, and I think Connor has some great uh, comments here on the applicable building face and how that has a, um, has a rhythm to it that comes out and addresses the street, mm -hmm. all things that are kind of implied within the, the mm -hmm. built form regulations. Yeah. Uh, so all these projections, pushing and pulling, just as Adam was mentioning earlier, it creates just more surface area on the building, more opportunity for energy loss, opportunity for leakage, all these types mm -hmm. of things that building cause building maintenance and are you know mm -hmm. happen to all buildings but there's ways to mitigate them yeah. both through operations and design mm -hmm. um this one we can probably skip it if you want to okay so yeah we wanted this i guess to kind of round up with an overarching point as it relates to the planning policy aspect and then we're going to dive into some slides around particularly around energy efficiency and building design is the more we're realizing as we're working within implementing this plan is that when we're looking through the lens of uh, cost efficiency and energy efficiency, um, it, it allows us, it's a lot more, um, there's a lot more opportunity to explore innovation if we have a, a more site-specific approach to the way we design and plan communities. Um, what we're finding right now is there's a lot of sites, there's a broad, um, even within the regional center is a fairly broad geographic area and there's um, regulations applied to that area entirely that and there's a lot of different sites, both community contextually, as well as geographically sloping conditions, all these types of things that create complexity. Mm -hmm. um, so by creating a bit less complexity and opportunity for flexibility, it can make way for innovation. It can make way for opportunity to do things differently and explore different um, solutions. Otherwise we are in a place where if there's incentive to kind of proceed it with status quo. So, um, it's an interesting kind of observation we had to date. This plan is quite new. It's only been a couple years old. HRM is actually going through a number of amendments to this plan currently. You may have seen this in the media recently. They are looking at making updates to this plan based on feedback received from both industry and the public. So it's a living document and we're looking forward to continuing to work with them on it. But these are some of our initial observations that kind of tie in today's discussion and, and Chris's observations as well. Is this ours? I don't think this is our building. What do you want? Oh. Fill in the blanks, I guess. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but anyway, we can skip past that. Um, 
we got a few projects we wanted to speak to. We'll I, I'll go through these fairly quickly because I want to give do want to give Adam some time to speak to the energy efficiency component. Mm -hmm. This is a project on Seymour Street that was recently constructed. Um, it's a student housing project uh, near right near the Dow campus, um, and it's an interesting project in terms of. Uh, the initial approach was to build this out of mass CLT um, timber construction. Uh, they had a lot of intent to build this, you know, in a much more sustainable way and much more carbon or not carbon neutral, but towards that, those types of goals. Um, but it got, once it got into the design process under this plan and the requirements under the plan and both building code, they actually ended up having to switch to, to building this building out of steel. Um, they, it wasn't concrete construction, but they did switch to a steel assembly to help mitigate the challenges of of the built form and as well as the market conditions at the time um overall it, it's it's a, quite a dense um interesting form of housing it provides furnished housing for students near campus um that is owned and operated by a, a private company that they're called the line best um, and they have a number of properties across the country this is their first in halifax this is a pro property more so in the heritage space that's currently under construction this is at the corner of south uh South Street and Barrington Street, the former Elmwood Hotel. Um, this is actually this week, I believe, or maybe early next week. They're planning to move and relocate this building closer to the intersection of South and Barrington Street to make way for new housing and development in behind it under the new South, uh, old South Suburb Heritage Conservation District plan. So we are working a lot both in the building code and energy, energy efficiency space with not only new construction, but integrating old um, and heritage buildings into new construction and the the energy um, efficiency approach to that and, and also the um, life safety approach to that and fire code approach. Um, and then this is more of a, a ground basing for ground based housing form that we are working on right now. Uh, this is a project near the intersection of Maple Street and Thistle Street in Dartmouth, kind of near the Flower Streets. Um, it's currently a, a parking lot um, that was previously used to store cars, uh, but it's not, not really being used for that operation anymore. So they're looking at developing more of a kind of walk-up style townhouse type unit. This is the type of housing that's really being incentivized in the low rise communities within our regional center. So, you know, you, houses that are in that two and a half to three story range that have exits and entrances directly facing the street um, are really being incentivized in our, our rural communities or not our rural communities, sorry, our um, low rise communities within the regional center. Again, this is another example of heritage integration. This project's currently under construction near tail end of it. Uh, this is near South Park and South Street. Um, and then, oh, your slides, didn't, these were your slides, Adam. I think so. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> For some reason, they came across like this. Okay. The, uh, I guess I can just hop in. If you put maybe on, is if there you, a certain slide that might help and then you can yeah i mean i think if you maybe if you jump back to where we were looking any of these yeah, I, yeah think, okay. I think this is a great slide uh so i guess what what's missing from the slides there is we were going to talk a little bit about the relationship between an energy efficient building and net zero energy and how those things kind of work together so um and i think chris you covered it excellent uh, earlier. Um, generally speaking, we're trying to use uh, mechanical systems and electrical systems that require as little energy as possible. Uh, and we're trying to have a building form that is uh, that is tight and that is simple and, you know, is uh, has a relationship to the program that's in it so that it kind of wraps the volume or wraps the program in an efficient way. Um, and then in addition to that, we're also trying to make it airtight, we're trying to make it well insulated. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of the kind of different cladding approaches and things you see now is because uh, what we've learned, I think, as an industry is that or outs or insulating on the outside of buildings works quite well. And, um, but in doing so, you end up moving your cladding further and further out, which is why we see so many of these kind of engineered lightweight claddings. We still see brick on buildings, of course, uh, but you'll see a lot more uh, kind of selection available of these lightweight engineered claddings that can be held out from the building structure to accommodate all that additional insulation. And in doing that, we're reducing a lot of the thermal bridging that we used to get in more traditional building types where you know our structural framing might be a little bit closer to the outside of the building. So you end up with heat loss you know, whether it's through the studs in your house or what, whether it's through um, kind of steel studs that might be on a more commercial style building. Uh, certainly in like a, a concrete building, you know, heat is, you can feel it. 
um, leaving the building as we speak. So uh, I think those are kind of the major implications, I think, to the building design as it relates to energy efficiency. And the other piece of that, of course, is uh, kind of that net zero energy model. And the goal there is really, one, reduce the amount of energy you need in the first place, and then have some on-site um, energy production, whether it's through so solar or if you are in a location that permits it wind, uh, some sort of power source that's a, that allows you to kind of meet the demands that the building has. So, you know, housing is one that is probably pretty reasonable in terms of uh, the intensiveness of the amount of energy. Um, and, you know, I think that, I mean, it's, it's an important thing to strive for. Um, and some of the things we talked about a little bit earlier were just the the challenges of building sites, um, the challenges of putting PV on roofs if if we do have forms where that area is restricted, um, and also some of the implications of ongoing, you know, maintenance and things like that of having your kind of power generation on the roof, knowing that you still need to maintain your roof and replace it every once in a while. And that creates challenges for us. And, you know, we're, we're certainly open to kind of going through those challenges and, and finding different ways to accommodate those things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just something we wanted to, I guess, talk about today and kind of go through some of those items. Yeah. And I think like, like I said, kind of one of the bigger themes we we're identifying and seeing right now is, you know, as these improvements to the building code come into place that we're really recognizing the collaboration that's needed between the way development regulations shape how buildings are designed and how the building code is required, requiring buildings to be built from both a life safety and an energy efficiency right. perspective, because mm -hmm. both are very relevant to the way buildings are shaped, the size of them, the height of them, all those types of things. So they need to be looked at in conjunction with one another. And they've been in silos, I think, too mm -hmm. much for a long time that there's opportunity through that for innovation and, and more alternative approaches to um, achieving the goals of both parties. So there's a mutual solution there um, that can be worked towards. And I think there's an opportunity as we work towards the, that 2028 goal, 2020, 2030 goals and beyond to you know, break down those silos and have more conversations to come up with those solutions. Um, so yeah, that's, I think, presentation we have today it was really just to give you a bit of an insight of the work we do how we're experiencing um this this lens of energy efficiency through housing and the scale of development that we're working in and the types of projects we're working on um so we're again we're really thankful for all you inviting us today and chris thanks again for inviting us as well and um, for all your time and certainly you're open for questions as well <laughs> did a question immediately from the back here Thank you very much. That was very interesting as well. This is the first presentation. Um, so I have a question. You were talking about, um, you know, looking around, you say mostly concrete um, uh, buildings being built and, you know, that you're looking at innovation in terms of the floors and all that kind of thing. So I'm not really that familiar, but I know I read in the paper there's this company and Halifax that has low carbon concrete or whatever. So in terms of materials, are these things that are just too expensive now to incorporate or why isn't this just sort of happening? Or maybe it is happening. I don't know if you could speak to that, please, or someone. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> depending on the project um, and the, I guess the the goals of the, or goals of the, the project, the mission value of those building the project, um, those things will be kind of brought forth as options. Um, I think there isn't currently any mandate necessarily that those would be used. Um, obviously, there's some cost implications of using some of those things. Uh, it takes uh, kind of an informed builder also to work with. Um, but in general, I think it's it's not just the, um, I guess, typical construction isn't at a point yet where this is just used everywhere. So it does take kind of an, an informed and motivated um, a builder or client group to get those into their into their projects. Uh, yeah, just that add a bit to that. I mean, you're you're totally right. I think a lot of it is that again, it's there's not a lot of regulations or specificity around regulation for that type of product. I think it we have I have heard about it in the marketplace as well. Um, and it's come up in some projects discussions. Um, but I think it's tying back to this overall theme of like if we're not 
creating regulation or, or um, legislation that's kind of forcing this type of innovation, then a lot of our conversations are kind of ending up at status quo. Um, and it's especially in a market like today where costs are so volatile and high, it's really uh, a lot of our, uh, our clients and developers are, are being a bit more risk adverse because of that. And that's going to take some time to, you know, get into these new innovative technologies and get them implemented on buildings. Um, but it's it's a tricky spot we're in right now with this the state of the market and costs. It's a tough challenge that we're facing every day with our projects. Um, but it, it's a great question. Oh, we have a number. of Questions back to this over here first. Thanks. I've got two questions. Um, first of all, I'm wondering where all of the raw material is coming from for the concrete. There must be some big holes in Nova Scotia. And uh, the second point, um, and this is mostly just to create awareness, but glass windows that reflect greenery cause bird collisions and deaths of many birds. And we're seeing so many buildings now that are glass. So is is that on the, the table at all in, in terms of mitigating the, the death of birds? I, I can't speak to the location of the, uh, the, the concrete, the first question. Um, in terms of locally, I'm not as familiar with legislation around the glass itself. Um, previously, I was working in Maryland, and they did have some legislation in place that um, there's different types of glass that can be fabricated that have, um, you know, it's it's almost invisible to the human eye, but there's lines and things like that that break up that reflectivity. Uh, and I'm trying to recall the standard, it's been years, but within a certain distance of the ground level, because it's usually when birds are, are taking off or landing where they are more likely to uh, have impact with a reflective glass. So they require, I, I'm trying to think back now, but I believe there was less re reflectivity on the glass and there was also some some visual breaks, but I don't know of anything here that's that's in the works, but maybe there is. I don't know. I, I, I'm not aware of anything either in terms of legislation or regulation in that regard. I know there is, um, it is a topic in planning uh, that has become more prominent and, and has had more discourse. Um, I do believe in the city of Toronto, even they have introduced some standards and guidelines for high rise buildings uh, around bird migration because there was a, a, a prevalent issue within cities. Um, so I know that's one jurisdiction within the context of Canada, um, but I, I, I'm not aware of any in the context of Halifax or Nova Scotia that that exists. Like you're absolutely right, it's something that there's discourse about, and there are legislations being made and implemented in that regard. Thank yeah. you. Um, there's one question online, so we'll take that first. This question is from online. Can you please give us an example of the amount of energy saved because of your design of one of these buildings that you've shown, perhaps the student housing on Seymour? Sure. Um, I don't, I can't quantify the exact amount of energy saved within that building. Um, I think there is a, a conversation though, and a lot of benefit and savings that can be had through design and through um, designing buildings in an energy efficient way. And there's a lot of ways that design can help um, solve that problem. Um, in terms of quantifying that, it's not something that I think is really quantifiable in a general sense. It's something that's very project specific and um, goal specific um, for the person building that building. Um, but I do, I do think that the, the work that we do and, and the work that designers can do can have a huge implication on the energy efficiency of buildings. Um, and I think it comes back to, we can't do it in silos though. It comes back to a, a, everyone coming together to create a, you know, network of um, collaborators that are working towards that common goal. Because if we're working in isolation, it's going to be hard to get out of status, status quo. So Absolutely. I think that's kind of my take in terms of uh, the impact that design can have on the energy efficiency of the building. And generally speaking, to to generate a good comparison often means that you need a, a baseline of some sort to compare it with. Uh, in some exercises that we go through, uh, if there's an energy model uh, created for a project, you may be able to say, if we do this, this is these are the anticipated values. And if we enhance the insulation or air tightness, or change the building envelope in some way, 
this is the you know this is the, a possible outcome which gives you a better sense i think of being able to analyze between the two of where you could be and where you are um you know what is code minimum what is the what is the baseline and what is the enhancement that we've brought by doing these other measures mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder whether uh, it would make sense to incentivize um, uh, co uh, commercial developments to to carry uh, uh, the PV solar generating on their roofs, not because it's uh, going to power the, the, the building that uh, lies below it, but because it's a contribution to uh, uh, energy generation uh, uh, as a whole. It's a, it goes to the grid. You get a in the case of a small a building with a small roof area, you get a, a small uh, rebate, presumably. But uh, overall, that space is being used to generate uh, a contribution to to the grid. Does that make any sense? <laughs> I'll let Connor that? answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there's kind of two thoughts I have on that one. The first is that... It, I think scale of a development has a lot of implications on that answer and, and the size of the site, the amount of um, energy you can generate from the solar panels versus the energy that the building's using, coming back to that net, near, net zero discussion. Uh, one tool that the center plan does have is um, a public benefit tool, which primarily now is being allocated to affordable housing. So when developers develop a new building, there's of course a fee they need to pay or they're required to pay um, that gets allocated towards an affordable housing fund. There's also different categories of public benefit that are available in the plan. Energy uh, um, efficient resources is not one of them at this point. Perhaps that's something that could be explored with the um, industry and community is something that could be considered as a way to incentivize developers to um, provide energy efficient solutions for their buildings. But right now there really isn't that incentive built in to, to the plan. Um, it's, it, it is in a lot of good ways geared towards providing funds for affordable housing. Um, energy efficiency isn't quite one that they've gotten through the public benefit tool yet, um, but it could be a potential option. Is there any consideration for access to a building, particularly if somebody has a mobility problem? And I have to tell you, we went to an apartment building for a book club. My husband and I drove a man with a walker. And in Lexington building, you can't get to the door within blocks. You have to go over to West Street. Now, for some reason, they have an elaborate ramp. But you can't get to it. And I'm just looking at buildings now, and I look and I say, what is my potential to access that building with somebody with a walker, for instance? Oh, that's uh, that's a great question. Um, there's uh, a number of accessibility guidelines that we're using now. I mean, I think a lot of the challenges uh, that we see is that older buildings, older codes, older accessibility requirements. So that, um, for instance, you know, the the turning radius associated with the code today will be different than a code tomorrow. Uh, the CSA guidelines around. Um, access from whether it's a, a local, um, you know, public transportation location in through the building uh, has changed quite a bit. Uh, in general speaking now, there should be um, a, can I, a accessible parking stall and from there you should be able to get into the entrance of the building and that's just a code minimum now um, for, for any of these buildings that would be, that would be addressed. Yeah, so I think that, that there is to your point kind of code minimums in terms of requirements for accessibility to buildings and it does require you know bare free access to the main entrances of buildings for newer construction to adam's point there was different codes in place for older buildings so it's tough to understand what the, the regulations were at the time when they were built but for new construction there is required to be barrier free access a lot of the times depending on that that requirement coinciding with mm -hmm. a lot of the other complex requirements that I had mentioned around the built form, kind of put piecing all those together can sometimes lead into a ramp that's super uninviting <laughs> um, and technically meets the, the building code in terms of accessibility requirements, but isn't something that's necessarily inviting mm -hmm. or um, 
operational for those with the lived experience that are trying to enter the building. Mm -hmm. So it does create situations like that. There are standards to Adam's point that are being developed, much more modern standards and generally accessibility standards within the code have become more and more um, integrated as the code is advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, but another standard that's become a lot more prevalent is called the Rick Hansen standard of accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, a much more universally accessible standard that is applied to not only buildings, but the public spaces between buildings mm -hmm. and uh, all the spaces that between the entrance and your car, for example, mm -hmm. um, focuses on those spaces as well. It's not something that those standards are not integrated into the National Building Code nor the Nova Scotia Building Code at this stage. So mm -hmm. it's not a requirement. However, we are seeing a lot of clients, particularly larger um, uh, clients that are have much more um, direct goals around sustainability and, and um, accessibility are now implementing these standards for those buildings, despite them not being required under the building code. So we are seeing a lot more um, investigation in that for some of our clients, but it's not a requirement for all of them. Uh, and it creates those types of situations you've mentioned <laughs> where technically, yes, that meets building code, but because of the comp putting all these pieces together for a new building design, it's created a ramp that isn't the most inviting. And, and also the um, the amendments to the Nova Scotia uh, codes around accessibility are out for public review right now. I think they'll be adopted in the new year, but they are available online if you want to go and check them out and see uh, see where things are headed because there's quite a bit of content in there. Mm -hmm. In your presentation, you were pointing out uh, some of the uh, uh, design uh, decisions that you thought might not be quite good for energy. And uh, uh, I wonder if with the new uh, building code that Chris was talking about, uh, would that change some of those designs? Or do you think you can still do your uh, street level and, uh, and fancy designs under the new code? And another associated question, uh, with these net zero buildings, um, the, the PV or the alternate energy source it doesn't have to be located uh, anywhere near uh, the buildings. Uh, you know, the grid could stand if you if you put in an area where there was a parking lot that needed to be covered with uh, solar PV. That uh, construction could include a parking lot somewhere else, and the power that it used could be uh, generated somewhere else. So, so we have the technology to do that. We just probably have to ask the uh, construction community to consider that when they're building their buildings, right? Or, what do you think about that? <laughs> I, I love the idea of not putting solar panels on all the roofs. You know, I think ground mounted solutions are great for many reasons. Um, they're easy to access. Any kind of replacement or damage is, is at ground level. So it's much easier for crews to kind of install them, maintain them and do all those things that they need to do over the course of their uh, kind of serviceable span. Um, but yeah, no, I think those are all great, great suggestions, great feedback. And I think in terms of your first question with the new changes coming to the building code as it relates to these complex regulations. Um, we're, we're looking at that right now. I think ultimately the new building code will be adopted and these change, these planning regulations will still be in place. So we're gonna be basically trying to find design solutions. Those solutions may also be more costly and energy efficient, but we don't understand the details of that yet. But it ties back to the sense of like, this building code is being adopted, but it's not being looked at in correlation with the development regulations. So. As an industry, we have to, you know, reconcile that, but there could be a way to, you know, for those to work together and everyone to kind of have a more successful solution in the end. Um, so we're in the process of that now. Uh, but yes, it, it, it certainly could present challenges for how we design buildings um, through those both of those lenses in terms of accessibility um, and energy efficiency. I just have a question. You said you couldn't quantify the savings in the Seymour Street one. Um, so how do you know when you're at tier three or tier five? Is it only an after the fact and this building is costing this much and therefore we have to build the offset to that? So so generally speaking, the percentages that uh, were up on the screen earlier today about generally it, it's percentage better than the model. Um, we'll call that the baseline. So. Generally speaking, when we're in the design phase, we'll develop kind of the building with the floor plans and the building form. Um, and that will go over to uh, energy modeler. And the energy modeler will say, based on 
the type of mechanical system you have based on the types of lighting you're using in your fixtures, um, we anticipate the electrical loads to be X. Um, and then in combination with that, they're taking into account what the insulation values are of our, ro of our roof, our walls and our floor and can determine based on that and a few other items, um, how much, how close we are to the baseline or how much better we are than the baseline. So that's how those percentages are achieved. It's typically, and you can extrapolate from that what the cost of that energy would be at the baseline versus how much energy it would take and what the cost of that energy would be at the enhanced rate. So that's generally speaking, um, how they would come up and quantify where you were in terms of what tier, um, but it would be based on that kind of energy modeling approach. In in my experience, that's how that's how we would do it. So yeah, in terms of the timing aspect, it is, the modeling process is done like throughout the design process and mm -hmm. is part of the design process. So we're designing buildings in response to modeling results a lot um, as we are going through the design process. In the case of Seymour, it, it's more so I don't I don't understand. I don't have the modeling info on me, sure. but it was part of the design process. Um, it is something that gets quantified and is part of information our client needs to understand, and to, especially when they're looking at operational costs down the road. Um, so energy modelers and, and the resources you mentioned through Efficiency Nova Scotia are the resources that are used as part of the design team to help inform our decisions on how the final building is designed. Well, thank you, Chris, Adam, and Connor for a very interesting presentation today. A lot to think about, a lot of notes being made. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.